Just before I begin, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak here. And Bereshus, the Marud Asur, Rabbi Bilit, Bereshus, Rav Weinrib, Shlita, my father and my father in law, and uh, obviously Bereshus Joel and Baruch and Ari, who's in whose zuchus this whole mitzvah has been, has been brought back. What, what I want to discuss with you today, I apologize if I miss any of the other Rabbanim, I see you'll be fine, I'm sure many other Rabbanim. What, what I want to discuss with you today is a, a question that bothered me for a long time. I started looking into the issue of Tcheles uh, because of one of my Talmidim actually, a number of years ago, the first time Joel came to DRS, I think he came twice, so okay, the third time he didn't get, but two, twice. So uh, one of my Talmidim actually started asking me about it and he said, you know, your Rebbe wears it, why don't you wear it? And I thought that was a fairly good question. So I started looking into the topic and the more I looked into the topic, the more one question kept annoying at me. And that is that it seemed that the case was so compelling. It seemed that pretty much every Gemara fit the science, although I'm not a scientist, so I'm not necessarily one to judge, but it seemed pretty, pretty compelling that this was in fact the Murex uh, was in fact the genuine article that this was actually the uh, the chilazon and this was actually the tcheles and I couldn't understand the other side I couldn't understand the other opinion why it is that there are so many people that have not yet begun to wear tcheles and I, I felt that it wasn't something that I was upset about it was just I felt that my own opinion is not really firmly grounded if you can't understand the other side. In general, that's, uh, that's, that, that's, that's the rule in arguing a halacha. If you can't see what the arguments the other side is making are, you don't appreciate what they're even talking about, then your own opinion is somehow lacking because you haven't really addressed all of the claims, all of the claims against. You know, there was, f over 500 years ago, there was a debate about reinstituting smicha. Uh, the Rabbanim in Svat at the time, which constituted the majority of the Gedolda Yisrael, based on the Rambam Pirisha Mishnai, tried to reinstitute smicha. And they didn't consult with the Rabbanim in Yerushalayim, who admittedly, by their own admission, were not as great in number or in, uh, in wisdom as the Rabbanim in Svat. But the Rabbanim in Yerushalayim said, you can't reinstitute smicha without consulting us. Because without consulting us, you haven't heard the other side. You can hear our side and then outvote us, that's fine. But if you haven't heard our side, then there's, there's nothing to talk about. And just last week, someone saw the flyer in our shul that uh, advertising this week's event, and someone came over to me after davening and said, you know, I just have one question, Rabbi. If it's really true, if it's really right, why don't the gedolim wear tcheles? So that's what I want to address. What is the other, the other side? Why don't the Gedolim wear Tcheles? Now when I say what is the other side, I'm not going to go through all of the arguments, how to go through each Gemara and show how each Gemara may not be a Raya to Murex. This has been done. There are Shurim online that you can find fairly easily that, that discuss this. I want to look at more broad strokes. I want to understand the general attitudes toward Halacha, and therefore this is more of a talk than it is a Shir, the attitudes toward Halacha and how Halacha develops in uh, in, in rejecting the murex as tcheles. Now, the, the question itself is a little bit of a, uh, of a straw man argument. Why do Gedolim not wear tcheles? One could argue that that's not true. The assumption is not true. There are many Gedolim who obviously do wear tcheles, one of whom is going to be speaking this morning in, uh, in, in a short amount of time. And there are others that, uh, other Gedolim Yisrael that proudly wear tcheles, and then there are plenty of others that probably wear tcheles, but for some reason reason or another don't want to share that information. It's uh, well known that Yisrael Belsky wore tcheles, but he didn't like to talk about it too much for whatever reasons that, that, that he had. Uh, so the, but, but still, there are clearly many, many people that do not wear tcheles, and I want to try to understand where they're coming from. So I think these people can be broken up into three groups. Group number one is those, those who don't need to do any research no amount of research will convince them because they believe fundamentally that it's impossible to bring Tcheles back. So research is irrelevant. You can bring all the proofs from every Gemara, from every scientific finding, from archaeology, from chemistry. It doesn't make a difference. It's not going to convince them. Then there's a second group of those who have researched and believe that research is important but have not been convinced by the authenticity of the Murex Tcheles. And then there's a third group who have done the research, are at least partially convinced, 
believe that it's at least a suffix, and some of whom believe that it's vadai, that it's actually the genuine article, that it is the real tcheles, but have outside reasons not to wear it. So let's, let's take one group at a time. Group number one, those who don't need to research it because nothing will convince them. This is most often the opinion associated with the Beis HaLevi. Rav Salvechik in a yard site shir, Shirun Zech Rav Mari, it's printed in the yard site shirim that uh, it's written there, Rav Yosef Dov Ta'an, talking about his great grandfather, the Beis Alevi, that his claim was, Keneged Va'amar She'ein Rayos Usvaros Yicholos Lochiach, Shum Davar, Bemili Deshaychli Lemesora, Sha'al Avich V'yagedcha, that no sort of proof can show anything or can accomplish anything in a manner that relates to Mesorah, where you have to ask your father, you have to go back to the previous generations, and it has to be handed down from one generation to the next. Sham ein hasvara machria ki im hamesorah atzma. Svara will do nothing for you in those situations, only Mesorah. And therefore, he rejected, the Beis HaLevi rejected the Redzina Tcheles at the time, and those who are of that line of thinking would reject any form of Tcheles, no matter how strong the proofs are. Now, interestingly, that is not the only report of what the Beis HaLevi actually held. That was the tradition in the Salvechik family, apparently. But the Redzina Rebbe at the time, he wrote, when he responded to all the Gedolim, those who, uh, who had claims against his Tcheles, he reported what the Beis HaLevi had said. And he said that, uh, according to the Beis HaLevi, the Redzina writes, If you will argue that the fish has been around the whole time, and everyone knew the entire time exactly how to extract the dye, and all throughout all the history, there was no mystery about how to extract the dye, how to apply the dye. And with all that knowledge, with everything they had, they still chose not to wear it? That's as if we have a Mesora, a tradition, that this item cannot be the Chilazon. Because if it were the Chilazon, why haven't people been using it for all this time. Now that's a very different argument than what Rav Salvechik reports in the name of his great-grandfather. Rav Salvechik reported in the name of his great-grandfather that you need a Mesorah and that's it. But the way the Redzina Rebbe reports it, it's not that you need a Mesorah and that's it. It's that if it's been available and there's no explanation why people haven't been using it, then that's a negative Mesorah. That's a Mesorah that this is not the right Tcheles. But there are those that uh, obviously would follow Rav Salvechik's family tradition, and therefore it's hard to argue. You can't really argue if that's, uh, if that's their tradition. They're going to follow in the opinion of the, the Beis HaLevi. It's difficult to understand. It's quite a chiddish that we don't rely on experimentation in verifying a mitzius. That is, uh, that is quite a chiddish because we do rely on experimentation in other, in other areas of halacha. But that's category one within this group that no amount of research will convince them. There is a 1B, there is another argument within that first group where no amount of research will convince them. And that is those who argue based on the Medrash. The Medrash Rabbah in Parsha Shalaf says that Tcheles was, uh, that the Chilazan was Nignaz, that it was hidden. The Sefri writes also that it was Nignaz the Tzadikim la'asud lavo. It's hidden away for the Tzadikim for some uh, future time. So the assumption therefore is that it magically disappeared from the Mediterranean and when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is ready in the times when Mashiach comes, it will magically reappear. So very difficult again to argue because there's nothing to talk about. There are no proofs, no, no amount of rayos that you're going to bring is going to change that belief. It's uh, the Arizal is sa said that uh, the Tcheles can only exist when there's a Beis Hamikdash. It seems historically very difficult to uh, make such a claim because we find that the Amorayim, at least throughout part of the generations of the Amorayim, had Tcheles and uh, probably throughout all the Amorayim, they had Tcheles and there was no Beis Hamikdash. And also the overwhelming impression of the Rishonim is that that cannot be taken literally because the Rith and the Rush who generally don't discuss Hilchas al the Meshicha do discuss
discuss in Menachas Parakat Tcheles, they do discuss the laws of, uh, of Tcheles. The Rambam talks about Tcheles as if it were something that existed in his time, or at least could exist. So it's difficult to understand that the Arizal should be taken la halacha, but that is category one. The first group of people, you can bring all the proofs, it doesn't make a difference, either because they hold you need a Mesorah, or because they hold that it's just something that has to wait until the times of Mashiach. The second category is the one that I find the most intriguing. Those who research the topic believe that research should help and still for some reason are not convinced by the authenticity. Now, these specific proofs from the Gemara and the Rishonim are too numerous and too detailed to go through in the time we have allotted, but I, we can at least say that almost every source in the Gemara can be argued that uh, Murex is accurate and probably can be quetched out that it's not accurate also. Meaning if you're looking to say that it is not the accurate Tcheles, you, uh, you, you, you can work with it. It's vague enough that there's, uh, that there's what to work with. But it seems that if someone is looking and you look at all the scientific evidence and you look that it actually fits uh, every Gemara, it seems very difficult to understand why would someone argue the other way. And I, I think it breaks down into, uh, again, two, two subcategories. There are some that argue the other way because they reject science as a determinant in halacha. That science cannot be taken into account whatsoever. So whatever archaeological digs you're going to do that will show that they were using murex as a dye and that it, was, uh, and that, that it most likely was the tchelis is completely irrelevant that you're, you're going into the sugya only looking at the Gemara. Rav Yashiv's formulation was, just as the Redzina Rebbe was convinced that he was right and was proven wrong, and just as Rav Herzog thought maybe he was onto something with the cuttlefish and was proven wrong, this too will one day be proven wrong. But it seems to disregard the strength of the archaeological evidence, the chemical evidence, it's, just, uh, it's, it's all just proofs that are, uh, that are an opinion today that will be gone tomorrow. Rav Asha Weiss, on the other hand, in a slight variation of that, doesn't think that, in general, his attitude toward Allah, he's one of the most, uh, if you can call it, progressive thinkers and poskin of our generation. So generally, he takes science into account, um, and, you know, in terms of DNA evidence and uh, things of that nature, he's, uh, he's very modern in his way of thinking about science as determining a metzius. But Rav Asher Weiss argues that there's a distinction to be made between chemistry and biology and physics on the one hand versus archaeology on the other hand. He believes that archaeology is a bunch of guesswork and that it's all irrelevant. He writes, We are not talking about a precise science when we're talking about archaeology. It's a lot of guesswork, a lot of estimation. We try to figure out based on logic, based on uh, estimation, what exactly went on by looking at an archaeological di dig. And he says that uh, whatever seems most reasonable is what the archaeologists conclude. That's not how halacha works. This is not the derech of the halacha, this is not the language of the halacha. And he says, if you need proof, they'll show you that there are archaeological digs that are millions of years old. And we know the Divrei Chazal, Shis al Alma, that the world is 6,000 years old. And therefore, we can completely disregard and discount archaeology. Now, uh, again, one could, uh, could argue that there, you know, even within the world of archaeology, sometimes there is a lot of guesswork and sometimes the evidence is so overwhelming and so compelling that it's, uh, that it's difficult to, uh, to deny. So that's one group within this second category. Those who have researched, believe it can be researched, but aren't convinced by the authenticity because they don't believe science can convince us in any which way. But then there's a second group within that second category. They believe that it could be researched, they would be convinced if all the research turned out to show that Murex is definitely the Tcheles. They may even believe that science is a determinant in Alapha. But there's a group that seems to believe that we cannot possibly 
come to a maskana, come to a conclusion where we say this is the chilazon, this is tcheles, if it goes against any rishon. As long as there's a rishon out there that we know says otherwise, that doesn't fit, then what we have can't be right. Now, if one is going to take that attitude, it would be impossible. It would be literally impossible to identify the, the true tcheles. It can't be both a fish and a snail, it can't be both blue and black, as per the Rambam in our stripes and our talus, which are black, and green, as per Rashi in Parshas Truma. It can't be all of those things. We have to live with the possibility that la halacha, we pass in like some Rishonim, and not like other Rishonim. And maybe even that some of the Rishonim w- were guessing at what Tcheles might have been, as Rizina suggests, that they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't have it. So they were working with a certain amount of, of guesswork. And this is not to say that we don't hold of the concept of Eilu Ve'elu Divrei Elu Kim Chayim. Of course we hold of the concept of Eilu Ve'elu Divrei Elu Kim Chayim, that both sides of a, uh, of a dispute amongst our greats are, are, are viable positions. But Rashi writes in Mesechus Ksuvos that Eilu Ve'elu Divrei Elu Kim Chayim does not apply when you're arguing about a fact. It applies when you're arguing about a halacha. Rashi is talking in the context of arguing about what somebody said. That uh, one Amora says that the Rebbe said this way, and the other one said the Rebbe said the other way. Well, he only said one way or the other. We assume he didn't speak out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. He didn't contradict himself. So Rashi says over there, we don't apply elu elu kim chayim. When we're dealing with facts, you can't say that they're both right. One is right and one, one is wrong. So it could be that the argument over here is about a Matthias. It's about the identity of what exactly we're talking about. And maybe, therefore, there is no Elu Ve'elu Divre'elu Kim Chaim. But even if there is Elu Ve'elu Divre'elu Kim Chaim, even if we were to apply Elu Ve'elu Divre'elu Kim Chaim, we have to understand what that means. That means that, uh, as Mori Rabbi of Shachter often likes to say, that when you learn Shittas Be'Shamai, you're being the kind of the midst of Talmud Torah. But God forbid for us to ever paskin like Shittas Be'Shamai. We're not supposed to do that. You're being Mekai in the midst of Talmud Torah. So if you're going to pass in the that's not black like the Rambam, you're still being Mekai in the midst of Talmud Torah when you learn the Rambam. It doesn't mean that the Rambam has to be correct, la halacha. I keep reverting back into making the argument for Tcheles, I'm supposed to be presenting the other side. The, the, uh, the argument goes that uh, we can't pass in against Rishon. So that's category two. Those who've researched and have not been convinced by the authenticity, either because they don't believe that science means anything in halacha, or they do believe that science can mean something, but they don't believe that we have the ability to paskin against the Risha. <coughs> then there are those, the third category, also somewhat intriguing, who are at least partially, if not totally convinced by the authenticity, and have outside reasons, external reasons, not to wear the tchelis whether it's socio-political reasons, other reasons not to wear the tcheles. Um, Baruch sent me just uh, the other week a letter from Rabbi Nachman Mendel Shafin, who I believe is a, uh, what did you say, he's a Dayan in Bnei Brak? Is that, uh, uh, Joel sent it to me? Baruch sent it to me. Joel sent it to me. Okay. Ah, okay. He's a Dayan in Bnei Brak, and he writes something unbelievable. It's an astonishing admission. He writes, Vitam rov gedole Yisrael. The reason that the majority of the Gedolei Yisrael she'ein la mishtam shemizeh, that they do not use this, e'inu mishum she'mefak b'kim ba'amitas ha'inya. It's not because they take issue with its authenticity. Ela mishum she'bemasayim shona ha'achronim, rather it's because in the last two centuries, nikva kargasha p'nimit, we have this internal sense, sholo mishanim dvarim, gam in min hadin, that we don't make changes, even if the halacha should have required that changes be made. And this is a protective shield we've built around ourselves against those who would try to change the wrong things, try to change things that ought not to be changed. That such a das Torah has the ability to uproot a mitzvah da'oraisa. The fear of change, the concern that things might change, can uproot a mitzvah da'oraisa. 
And he goes on to suggest that maybe if a new community were to start somewhere where they don't already have established minhagim, then we'd be allowed to change certain minhagim. He gives interesting examples how in Europe there were many communities that followed the Zman of Rabbi Natan, both for the end of Shabbos and the beginning of Shabbos, and now we go against uh, the Shita of Rabbi Natan for when to, not just when to begin Shabbos, but when to end Shabbos, we end Shabbos, earlier, at least the way some understand our, our practice. He said, yeah, because when the Jewish community started in America, they were able to choose their own path, and they were able to determine a halacha from, from the beginning. So that's one possibility that we're, and, and there is a certain um, healthy pushback that should be had whenever there's something new. Uh, and uh, he argues that the healthy pushback is more than a healthy pushback. It's an entire protective shield that's built around the community. Then there are others that are worried about the financial constraints that people already have. Uh, Shafta told me in the past that he, he heard the rumor at least that uh, that was what was really behind Rav Yashiv's rejection, that he was concerned. Can you imagine if Rav Yashiv's Zephron of Rachel would have put on Tchelis at the time, how many tens of thousands of people who didn't have uh, two nickels, they didn't have uh, food to put on the table, would be running out to buy Tchelis for hundreds of dollars, and uh, what kind of strain that would put on the community. At the time, supposedly the, the, the supply wasn't there. Now I think the supply is there. You'll correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong. The supply is, uh, the ability for the supply, at least, is there, has been enhanced. Um, and then there are those that are worried about political fallout, which is the one that's, that's most difficult to really connect to. That it's not the yeshivish thing to do. Uh, Rabbi Reisman, uh, in his uh, shiurim on the topic, has referred to Tcheles as like the black hat of the Dati Lumi community. That it's become, uh, you know, if you want to associate with a certain community, so uh, in the yeshivish world you have to put on a hat so you uh, fit in with everybody else. So he argued that maybe Tcheles is like the black hat of the Dati Lumi community, or maybe better put, it is the anti-black hat of the yeshivish community. So uh, it's the same as taking off the black hat when you put on Tcheles in the yeshivish community. A more moderate version of this was formulated by Rav Sternbach when Rav Sternbach discusses Los Skodidu, that one shouldn't do something that is against the practice of everyone else around him. And he says in a Kan Shalos he says around us where we don't find anyone who wears Tcheles, Lo Naniach Le'eze Mishaseid Lilbosh Kein B'Shash Heino Afilu Mesores Avosav. We can't let someone who wants to be a Chassid to wear the Tcheles when that's not even the Mesores of his family and he's going to choose to wear tchelas. So essentially, I think I have an understanding of certainly of the Gemaras on, the, on a basic level of what the arguments are, pro and con, but in, in, a broad, in a broad level, what the three basic groups who reject the Murex Tcheles, where they're coming from. Certainly we understand those who have such a, an idea of the strength of Mesorah, that without a Mesorah nothing, nothing can be done so the discussion doesn't even begin. We uh, understand that there are those people who do not believe in the ability of science to be a determinant at all, or in our ability to paskin against a Rishon. And then there are those people who are convinced but are worried about political fallout or other things. Wrap it up. Five more minutes. Okay, so let's wrap it up. I'm wrapping up anyway. The, uh, I think it should just be emphasized that the return of a mitzvah like this is incredibly exciting. I'm sure this has been emphasized many times. Uh, when I introduced Ari in my shul yesterday, first of all, I pointed out that in, uh, he spoke twice in my shul, in the early minion and the later minion. In the early minion, we have about 35 uh, adults, 35 men with talisos in the early minion. And I counted before I introduced him, we had 13 people wearing tchevas. I, I don't think such a number would have existed 10 years ago. Um, I don't think it would have existed even five years ago. Meaning, the, the, it, it moves slowly, and that's probably a healthy thing, that things uh, move somewhat slowly. So the argument that, why should I do it, other people aren't doing it, is an argument that's slowly going to fall away, as people realize that, uh, that there's, there's, no reason, there's no reason not to, and there's every reason to. But I, I think there's an even more important point, just emotionally, that we need to internalize. If you imagine for a moment, 
that you, you find out about somebody who lives in some small town in the middle of America where he doesn't have access to many Jewish things, doesn't live in an area like the five towns where there's kosher food and come Sukkot time there's Dalad Minim on every street corner. He doesn't live in a place where he has access to things like this. And you find out that there's this person who's becoming a Balchuva and he wants to observe mitzvot, but he has no access to an esrog. So you go out of your way and you find an esrog you wrap it and pack it in such a way where it's not going to become puzzle. You ship it in just in time for the Yom Tov of Sukkot. So you ship it in in time for, uh, for the Yom Tov. You'd, pe- you'd feel pretty good about yourself if you did something like that. You helped someone do a mitzvah da oraisa for one day. Now imagine that it wasn't an esrog, it was tefillin. You're helping someone do a mitzvah da oraisa almost every day except for Shabbos and Yom Tov. Now imagine that it's not just this one person that needed tefillin, but you've provided tefillin to thousands of people who otherwise would not have had this mitzvah. And now imagine that these thousands of people are not only beginning to do the mitzvah of tefillin, but for over a thousand years their ancestors had missed out on this mitzvah. That's how long the mitzvah had been lost how precious and how special you would feel and how chashuv you would be if you were the one that was able to provide that, how exciting that would be. And I think it's not a stretch, it's in fact a spot on mashal for what the group of, 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 of three men who are not Rabbanim by profession have been able to do for Klal Yisrael. They've brought a mitzvah da raisa that for over a thousand years we and our Fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers have not been able to do. And it's not like tefillin where you wear every day except Shabbos and Yom Tov. You wear every day including Shabbos and Yom Tov. These are extraordinarily exciting times and it's an extraordinarily exciting find. And we should uh, show tremendous Akar to, uh, to to Joel and to Baruch and to Ari for the tremendous work that they've done for Kali Yisrael.